is now in its third year uh, with active engagement with 18 countries, well, 50 more are in the pipeline for becoming the program's partner. As for other similar initiatives involving primary data generation, in the past months, 20, 50 by 30 initiative had to adapt to the new circumstances brought by the pandemic. With the situation slowly going back to normal, we're very happy to report that the first 50 by 20 integrated household survey program is currently kicking off in Uganda. As we all know, the pandemic was also an opportunity for us to reflect more thoroughly together on the role that the initiative can have in leading the survey innovation agenda. It also gave us an, a chance to consider its uh, value added in terms of integration with new data sources and methods. Uh, which really have gained momentum during this pandemic. So in this sense, I think this event today um, at the UN Data Forum is particularly relevant and it comes at the right time and it shows how the 50 by 30 initiative can really contribute to advance the research agenda on data integration. It can also support the uh, repositioning of the household and farm level service in this novel landscape. I'm really glad that we have these five uh, presenters today. Um, there are some of them uh, closely linked or affiliated to the 50 by 30 initiative. For example, uh, my colleague Talik, who manages important portions of the uh, methodology uh, component of the initiative especially uh, those related to the integration of ground and earth observation data. Others are potential technical partners. So we're very happy that you're with us today. Uh, for example, uh, our presenters from uh, Radiant Earth and Aero Arable, who will illustrate innovative technical solutions and share with us the vision um, that uh, ground data are not just a thing of the past. We also have uh, Hamad, and Jess, whom I need to especially thank for connecting at this very early hours in the States. Uh, I'm just really excited to hear from you um, because I really want to learn from your view on how a private company and a nonprofit sector can contribute techn technological solutions that generate in informative cost effective data that can be shared with a wide audience of users globally to maximize their um, informative value while uh, protecting confidentiality of the respondents. We also have a visionary head of an NSO in Dominique, someone who has been pushing the methodological frontier in the realm of official statistics with his leadership uh, at Statistics Poland, uh, who can really help us think through how data innovation can be grounded and come to terms with the rigor that is re required of official statistics. Dominique is a long-term friend and partner of the World Bank, and we have MOU uh, with uh, uh, Statistics Poland to help us make this collaboration uh, uh, very concrete in supporting other countries. Last but not least, we have KISS, who represent uh, you both, one of the NSOs with which the initiative is implementing an ambitious integrated survey program that is just going to the field as we speak. Keith, who is also a farmer and activist, who will take us back to what it all means for the primary producer of data, our respondents, the subject who participate in our surveys, and how we can fulfill the responsibility of giving uh, value back to them through a more uh, deliberate approach to uh, valuing data use. So with that, uh, let's get started. Just a few uh, housekeeping uh, uh, information. Um, uh, after the uh, presentations, I hope that it will keep very con uh, uh, concrete and concise. Uh, we will have two rounds of discussions. The, in the first round, I'll pose some questions to each of the speakers, but then we will uh, uh, respond to some of the questions posed by you. Uh, so please uh, be actively participating and pose your questions in the, in the two platform uh, so that we can uh, try to uh, address them uh, as many as possible. 
In the chat, you will also see some useful links of, of important resources mentioned today during the presentation. Um, the uh, session is recorded and will be posted on the World Data Forum uh, website as well as on the 50 by 2030s initiatives website. We will use the hashtag 50 by, 20, uh, 50 by 2030 if you want to follow along and join the conversation online. Um, so let's get started. Uh, first, let me uh, invite uh, my colleague Talib, who will um, talk about how the 50 by 2030 has been advancing our knowledge on how to collect geo-referenced ground data in agriculture in a way that maximizes their use in conjunction with Earth, Earth observation data. So Talib, please kick us off. Thank you so much, Aishan, and thanks uh, everyone uh, that are in Bern uh, in person and connecting online today. Uh, my name is Talib Kulich. Today I'll be presenting uh, some of our ongoing work uh, with colleagues at uh, Atlas AI, uh, a private firm uh, that is a technical partner to the 50 by 30 initiative uh, on integration of surveys and satellites for monitoring smallholder agricultural activities in, uh, in low-income countries. Uh, of course, uh, we all appreciate the importance of uh, agriculture to uh, rural livelihoods uh, and in sub-Saharan Africa it can contribute up to 85% uh, of rural household income. Uh, to monitor progress towards national and international goals, uh, we need accurate measures of uh, crop areas, uh, production and yields, not only at the national level but with uh, sufficient uh, within country uh, disaggregation. Uh, however, in many lower income countries that rely on uh, smallholder farming uh, that need the productivity improvements the most, uh, these uh, data are uh, either unavailable uh, or, uh, or unreliable. Uh, what has been a game changer in the last few years that can help uh, fill data gaps is the dramatic increase in uh, high resolution uh, satellite imagery. Uh, these are European agencies, uh, Sentinel-2 satellites that I'm sure many of you are familiar with that are providing uh, 10 meter resolution imagery for the entire Earth uh, every five days uh, and, for, uh, and for free. Uh, but still, uh, we need data uh, to train and validate the models that are applied to high resolution satellite imagery uh, to op obtain agricultural statistics with uh, improved spatial uh, and, and temporal uh, resolution. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the 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 literature in the in the last few years uh, has been active in this in this particular area. There are several important takeaways that uh, provide a motivation for our work. Uh, first of all, uh, we've seen that training data uh, actually have a bearing on the quality and the spatial resolution uh, of our estimates, and we had showcased this prior to this work uh, in Uganda and Mali. Uh, we've seen that uh, research has been uh, primarily at subnational levels uh, with significant heterogeneity in the type of and, and approach to uh, training data collection. Uh, and, and last but not least, uh, obviously, large scale surveys can address training data needs uh, for Earth observation applications on crop area mapping and crop yield estimation. But currently, uh, there are no uh, clear recommendations on on survey methods and field protocols that can produce the right training data. And without these recommendations, it's not possible to uh, assess the utility of existing household surveys, uh, as well as to design future household surveys uh, to provide the right training data. So uh, against this uh, background, uh, our recent paper answers three research questions uh, in the context of maize area mapping uh, in Uganda, sorry, in, in Malawi and Ethiopia. Uh, first of all, uh, we'd, we'd like to we'd like to understand how much training data we need uh, to reach an acceptable level of accuracy of a crop classification algorithm. Uh, second, we'd like to understand how the approach to georeferencing plot locations on the ground uh, impact our uh, accuracy. Uh, and third, uh, we'd like to know whether the type of satellite data or exclusion of plots uh, under specific area thresholds. Uh, affect our uh, accuracy. So to answer these questions, we bring together georeference plot data from uh, recent uh, national surveys from Malawi and Ethiopia, integrate them with uh, Sentinel-2 imagery and other complementary geospatial data, and feed them into a machine learning framework that uh, simulates over 
26,000 uh, scenarios under which uh, remotely sensed predictions on maze areas are calibrated and, and validated with georeferenced uh, survey data. And ultimately, uh, this paper, together with ongoing research, will feed into the guidelines that are being developed by the 50 by 30 initiative uh, to advise NSOs and, and, and survey practitioners to collect the right training data for downstream uh, earth observation applications. So here are key headline findings from our paper. We find that uh, collecting a complete uh, plot boundary is preferable to competing approaches to georeferencing plot locations. Uh, we also showcase that uh, seemingly small erosion uh, in, 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 our, uh, in our accuracy uh, as a result of relying on less preferable approaches to uh, georeferencing plot locations, in fact, consistently results in uh, overestimation of total maze area under cultivation, and that ranges from anywhere from 8 to, to 24 uh, percent. We, we showcase that uh, georeferencing the complete set of plot corners is a second best strategy and can approximate uh, full plot boundaries with, with comparable model performance. Uh, our, our classification performance peaks uh, with about 60% of the training data. And, and if only a single GPS uh, point is feasible to collect, we advise that to be uh, near the plot center uh, as opposed to a single corner point, which has been the prevailing approach uh, in, the, in the last decade, at least in the countries that we've been working in. So, uh, as a result of this of this work, uh, and and uh, based on the best performing models, we've also made available 10 meter resolution crop area and maize area maps uh, for Malawi and Ethiopia uh, for each agricultural season from 2016 to 2019, and these are freely available on World Bank uh, Development Data Hub. Uh, this is a very quick overview of uh, what they look like and the, and the high resolution of the data. This is zooming into a high production area uh, in, in Ethiopia, and this is overlaid with, uh, again, Sentinel-2 imagery with that area. So feel free to check that out. Um, and obviously, uh, looking forward, we have several lines of um, uh, ongoing uh, ongoing research. Uh, we're expanding the work to additional countries and to additional crops uh, and, and covering additionally Mali and Uganda uh, and, and moving crop area mapping to uh, other cereals uh, as well as moving into crop yield estimation as well. Uh, there are going to be several lines of work uh, in understanding uh, the uh, accuracy implications of relying on different modeling choices. Uh, as well as uh, gauging the performance of our models in 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 uh, intertemporal uh, predictions, and ultimately, if the COVID-19 pandemic allows, uh, we'll move uh, from using existing survey data to conducting uh, survey experiments uh, to gauge the sensitivity of our recommendations. So, thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, Talib. Um, it's, it's really great to hear what you have been leading uh, in, in, uh, with the innovation that introduced in countries. Um, we are going to move to our uh, second speaker, um, Hamad, who is the chief uh, data scientist um, at the Radiant Earth Foundation. Hamad will um, present the Radiant Machine Learning Hub, ML Hub, a project by Radiant Earth uh, Foundation constituting the world's first cloud-based open library dedicated to machine learning uh, ready training data. I'm just really excited um, to, to hear about this. So, um, it's floor is yours. Thank you, Aishan. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, so, my name is Hamad al Mohammed, as Aishan introduced me. And today I'm going to talk about uh, Radiant ML Hub uh, and how we go basically from ground referencing to ML-ready training data in an open access repository. Uh, so a quick slide about uh, who we are. Uh, Radiant Earth Foundation is a nonprofit organization. Uh, our mission is to uh, empower individuals and organizations who are working across the development sector uh, to better use these open access satellite data together with the advancements in the machine learning techniques to address global challenges. Uh, we do that by providing open access training data and tools and best practices and guidelines. So we work closely with the community uh, to empower them and provide training and capacity development in addition to the data. Um, and everything on our side is basically doing this in an open access and community uh, uh, collaboration way. 
Uh, as Talib was just talking about the role of training data, I want to also highlight what are now the challenges. So when you think about applying machine learning um, into earth observation data and doing, for example, agriculture or monitoring, we still, as a community, have challenges around these training data, particularly uh, lack of geographical diversity. When you want to do crop type mapping in a uh, smallholder dominated region versus a more industrial region, you need training data uh, and references that are applicable to that region. Uh, we still have that lack of geographical diversity. Uh, we have a scarcity of data sources. We don't necessarily go to every region and collect data on the ground. Uh, there can be issues with uh, uh, being inaccessible or being very expensive or hard to get there. Uh, even when we have data, data accessibility is an issue. So sometimes there are data, but it is not easily accessible or discoverable to the community who is interested to build applications, build models and support uh, decision makers and policy makers with solutions. Uh, and the last two are what I call interoperability and ML readiness. Uh, when you think about ML frameworks, they have their own way of uh, digesting data uh, and doing ground referencing is a different thing. So bridging the gap between these two worlds uh, and making sure when we are benchmarking data sets and models, there is a standard format, there is a, a interoperable format that users can easily consume the data and focus on the application development rather than on the data engineering part is a key piece of our work. So, uh, and if we don't address these, we are gonna end up with uh, models that are not necessarily uh, accurate uh, or I would say uh, uh, performing well across different regions. So we look at this as I would call a data ecosystem. So you can see the data journey as I call it here. Uh, we go from usually data collection, uh, then to publication, then there's uptake and then there's impact. Uh, and there's always a feedback loop, as you see here, between all of these steps. Uh, because we want to make sure the collection is supporting the publication, is supporting the uptake, then it's supporting the impact. Uh, without looking at this as an ecosystem and just doing collection or just doing publication, we are not addressing this problem at large. Uh, what we do at Radiant is primarily focused on publication and uptake, so making sure the data is available and discoverable to the community. But we work closely with teams and organizations who are working in the collection phase to make sure data is a standard and then in the impact phase. So I'm going to show you uh, the work that we have done with the teams about how we can standardize some of these data collections on the ground uh, and then standards and best practices to publish the data and making it accessible on a cloud repository. And then uh, down the road, how we basically support organizations, teams and individuals who are working in the uh, uptake and impact to make sure users can easily access and uh, build solutions out of these data. Um, our initial work was focused on, uh, I would say, a very early draft of a guideline for ground referencing. Uh, we, we came across this after going through more than actually 30, 35 data sets that have been collected throughout the years for agricultural monitoring purposes and looking at are they usable for machine learning applications when it comes to applying them to earth imagery. Uh, and we found a lot of issues and lack of metadata and specification in those. So we developed these guidelines together with many stakeholders across the ecosystem, particularly uh, those in Africa. Uh, and this guideline is basically trying to address how you should be specific about your geographic data collection, uh, how you should guide your uh, basically annotators and data collectors about class cons consistency. Uh, what are the specifications for those metadata about whether it's about data provider, whether it's about methodology, whether it's about the tooling that you use to the data collection. And last but not least, the licensing and the format of the data. These are very key to make sure the data is usable and adoptable, basically. Um, and building on top of that, uh, this year we work closely with two organizations, Tetratech and ODK. Uh, ODK is actually an open uh, cell phone app some of you might be familiar with. Uh, uh, in a project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we have now established basically a standard for mobile field data collection. Uh, the form itself is now implemented into ODK, but it can be applied to any other tooling. It doesn't need to be ODK. You can adopt it in any other uh, apps that uh, many organizations and teams use. But you're seeing screenshots of how we do different things in there from field boundary collection to answering many questions about the uh, field and things like that. And we did this again by bringing about 15 different groups and organizations who piloted this form on the ground, provided feedback, we went through four iterations of the form, uh, and it's now available publicly for use if you go to cropanalytics.net uh, under the tools you can access this. Uh, and we would love you to test it out and also provide feedback, but it's also available for anybody to adopt and use in their project. Uh, 
Um, another specification that we work with the community was about how to publish data. Uh, and this is what we call a spatial temporal asset catalog. If you're interested in that, uh, you, can, you can look it up online. This is about, oh, we have a set of geospatial data, training data, reference data, we wanna publish it. What is the best way to do that? And we do it ourselves on the ML Hub catalog. Uh, this is a, a, a snapshot of our website. This is how you see the different geographical data sets that we have. Uh, you can scroll down, you can filter by different things. We just uh, publish anything geospatial. It is not all crop types, but majority of our data are crop types because of the role of agriculture. And you can get the documentation of data, a DOI and citation for it, example use cases, and also like Jupyter notebooks for those like uh, tech savvy people who wanna really consume the data. Uh, and it's all open access and free to everyone. Uh, and the website is mlhub.rs, I will show shortly. Um, and a screenshot of where we have data, you can see this on the website as well. We have different data sets. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to thank you all for attending. And yeah, mlhub.earth is the website. You can definitely look up on the data sets and join also our Slack community if you have questions or discussions you wanna chat with our users. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is just amazing uh, service you are providing uh, it, it, you know, to have this open library uh, allowing um, the data to be more creatively used widely. It's just very inspiring. Thank you so much. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Uh, but before we go to that, uh, let's move on to our third uh, presenter, Jess Bollinger, who is the Vice President of uh, Strategic Partnership Arable Land. Um, let's hear from Jess how they have been working on uh, through Arable Land, such a dynamic young company, to developing to develop innovative solutions for improve improved decision making and agriculture. So Jess, it's your turn. Thanks. Um, I'm excited to be part of the conversation today with this lineup of speakers. It's very early in California, but um, hopefully in the future we'll be able to meet in person again. Um, I'm Jess Bollinger. I'm the VP of Sales and Business Development now at Arable. Um, we build IoT sensors. I don't know if you can see me. Um, they go out in the field and sit directly above the crop. Um, and we started the company actually out of a need that researchers understood um, in East Africa, specifically as they were looking at large data sets of satellite data and trying to do um, to build models and recommendations for growers. Um, and what they discovered is that there was often um, a lack of the granularity of the data that you would need to build these recommendations, um, and that oftentimes with other data sets, um, data would be missing or cloud cover would impact the ability to really understand what was happening on the ground. Um, and so, you know, with that, we've really built out our company and we primarily serve commercial agriculture right now. Um, we work with a lot of the large input companies, um, more on the research side to develop genetics and crop uh, protection strategies um, in their product development pipelines. Um, but again, now that we have a more stable product um, and have really proven out more of the connectivity, um, I'm going to speak today about one of the projects we're actually working on with the World Food Program in Mozambique, and, and that's going to be kicking off next month. Um, and so uh, in a partnership with the World Food Program, um, we're actually uh, beginning to work more again with smallholder farmers, which is something that our company is, is very passionate about. Um, and for those of you who are less familiar with the smallholder context, um, approximately 500 million smallholder farmers produce 80% of the food consumed by the developing world. Um, this is really underscored by the fact that um, given, you know, changing climate scenarios, um, vulnerability of these population groups, catastrophic event typically wipes out any savings generated and prevents long-term investment and growth. Um, and what the WFP has done um, in Mozambique is they have begun this program called R4 Resilience. Um, and it's an innovative way for these smallholder farmers to access um, insurance and to help them mitigate the risk that's often associated with these large-scale catastrophic catastrophic events. Um, and Mozambique is particularly interesting. Agriculture accounts for 70% of the income of the population. Um, it's also, you know, in 2019, the country most impacted by extreme weather events. Um, recurring emergencies in that region have um, required $3 billion of recovery investment from international organizations. Um, and so it is a, a, a great place to begin this really important work. Um, I mentioned a little bit about our company, but we build um, device 
devices and sensors meant to complement the data sets that you get from satellite and, and uh, remotely sensed sources. Um, and some of the other projects that folks on this panel are discussing right now, um, being able to have a source on the ground to understand um, the difference from, from what you're seeing from the atmosphere from what's actually happening in the field. Um, the devices are designed to be extremely compact so they can ship anywhere in the world. Um, and they uh, connect to global cellular with a single button press. And so immediately the data is online, um, pulling back to our server, um, and we can send um, information about the weather, precipitation, temperature, forecast data, um, more stuff that's specific to agriculture, solar radiation, upwelling and downwelling, long wave and short wave, um, and then some of the crop parameters. So we have a seven band spectrometer on it um, that's measuring uh, red, yellow, green, blue, red edge, and two near infrared bands. Um, so from that, being able to look at NDVI um, and chlorophyll index as a way to understand biomass changes um, and ground cover. And the concept is really about putting in the climate drivers um, with the outcomes and beginning to build machine learning models about how one impacts the other. Um, and then as that relationship is understood over time, being able to make recommendations to growers on what is the behavior change that they can take to, you know, mitigate that risk or in the future, you know, optimize outcomes in the field. The data sets that we collect, like I said, they go directly to mobile phones, but also through SMS uh, and notifications and can be accessed through APIs. Um, so, you know, if you think about how many devices we have out over the world, really starting to have a large scale data set. Um, where we're collecting, I think it's 1.5 million data points per week, um, and being able to, to see on a, a larger scale basis what is happening around the world. When we think again about the smallholder context, you know, what, is, what are the things that really have an impact? Um, being able to look at when precipitation events are happening in the field, Often precipitation um, is, is tricky to see from a satellite just because it's highly variable and the size of the grids make it difficult to understand why it rained in one field versus another field. Um, and the timing of precipitation is really important as you go into the planting season um, to understand if seeds are going to germinate and become plants. Um, and so along that same time, um, along that, that same thought is that because we have the ability to see the biomass in the field above the crop is that we can actually see if the crop are germinating. Um, and so one of the things that we're looking at through this project is being able to understand um, if there is biomass development in, in, in these different communities that we're going to be working in, um, you know, does that mean that the precipitation time was effective? Um, and then if we do not see the, bio, uh, the biomass development, is there a way to associate this data with the insurance product to trigger a payout so that they can replant seeds quickly and still have access to sta stable crops? There's other interesting tools that we can build out. We're monitoring um, all of the parameters that would be indicative of disease presence. Um, so with this data set, you could do interesting things um, like co uh, collaborate with spore traps um, or pheromone companies um, to be able to understand and combat uh, fall armyworm type of risks, um, just because you would have better indicators of when there would be heightened disease pressure in different uh, locations uh, around the world. Um, for the project that we're starting, it really pulls together, um, you know, local uh, researchers from ENAM in Mozambique, the World Food Program, and models that they're already building out through contracted insurance companies um, through the R4 Resilience Program. And then we also have a number of local partners that are going to be helping us um, with last mile climate service recommendations to 87,000 smallholder farmers. Um, this project is a $100,000 proof of concept that we're doing with the World Food Program. Um, and it's really targeting three districts in Mozambique um, where it's the majority women farmers. Um, and so we're super excited about this work and hopefully we'll be able to share back soon on you know, what this data impacted, not only on the ground, but what this larger data set attributed to in our understanding of climate change in the region. Um, thanks everyone. If you have questions about this or wanna get in touch, I'd love to talk more about it. Thank you so much, Jess. It's, it's just absolutely fascinating to hear how Herbal Lab is really pushing the frontier and, and connecting with the practical real problems on the ground uh, to help us. Uh, get. Thank you so much. Now, let's uh, change gears a little bit. Uh, let's uh, go to uh, Dominic uh, uh, Rothkrot, who is the president of uh, Statistics Poland. 
Dominic, uh, we're really looking forward to hear uh, from you how Statistics uh, Poland has been really pushing for data innovation for official statistics. Floor is yours. Uh, okay, great. I, I think it's coming up. Uh, I think, are you muted? We can't hear yeah, you. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's fine. No problem. Uh, and uh, now, now, now I have to uh, start sharing again. Mm. Just screen share. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it came up beautifully. So you see the whole presentation? Yes, or? We, we, we see the whole presentation. Okay, you, you, never know. you never know what happens. So, okay, thank you very much. So, uh, I just want to share some of the experiences that we have in terms of remote sensing and official statistics, especially in this uh, field of agricultural statistics. And, I, 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 you know, we started like uh, three years ago, maybe, or four years ago, and I, and I just uh, quickly uh, uh, realized that there's no, no other way forward than just to try to learn these uh, new technologies. Uh, because, you know, the way we used to do statistics in the past, they're very efficient or effective, I would say, we wouldn't be efficient anymore because, uh, you know, if you can do something for free, you know, taking advantage of all these satellites flowing around the, the earth and, and having the access to, to the data that's coming out of it, uh, then, then, then you cannot compete with anything traditional, I would say. So uh, we wanted to, to jive, jump, jump into uh, very quickly. Of course, that was all, you know, part of a much wider initiative to uh, try to dive into the issue of new data sources and, and use it in official statistics and the whole uh, our organization. But uh, of course, I, I used to say at the beginning, that this is the lowest hanging fruit, I would say. That, uh, that was the easiest one. Of course, it's not easy, but uh, what I want to stress to everyone who would like to try that, it's also not uh, rocket science, it's doable, but you need to invest, you need to find partners, uh, especially uh, in our case, these were uh, partners from academia, and, and you can do that. And uh, what we started doing, actually, we have uh, we had some financing from our you know national R and D sponsor agency uh, uh, for uh, having the contract with two uh, uh, two institutes. One was Space Research Center of the Polish Academies of Sciences, and then the other one was the Institute of Geodesy and Cartography. And uh, we had these uh, on a two or three years project almost on on and trying to. Uh, uh, and learn how to use uh, 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 the new technologies to come up with uh, something like that, crop estimates 2021. Uh, we've been able already to publish these for two years, for the last two years. Uh, they are still marked or branded as experimental statistics, but we have a very distinct plan to uh, get, uh, 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 so to stop all this traditional collection, you know, we, we've been continuing the collection in order to, to, to have data to, to teach our algorithms. Uh, but it's going to be limited more and more, uh, and then only these results will be presented. And, and this is, of course, a map of Poland. And I can tell you, you can zoom in, zoom in as 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 the, as, as much as you want. You know, uh, we are using the same data from Sentinel, and, uh, uh, and this is uh, something that we are very proud of, and uh, that we are already that we have already integrated into our kind of like regular production. Of course, <clears throat> I have a few slides that I want to don't want to spend too much time on it because these are in, even though they are very superficial they, they start to be very technical as well but but but, but of course we have the central one central two uh, satellite for agricultural crops mapping uh, we take these data we, there's uh, some kind of a data preparation in terms of the satellite data themselves but there's also some preparation in terms of administrative geodata and, and we are lucky to a degree that, you know, our administrative records are pretty good, of reasonable quality, and we can just link those uh, with uh, satellite data very easily. So it helps a lot uh, if you already have this infrastructure in your country. Uh, but if you have it, then, you know, uh, you, you just select non-agri areas, you just get rid of non-agri areas, choose representative parcels, and then you apply, you know, machine learning algorithms. And uh, after the segmentation, of course, and you can come up with the uh, you know pretty precise estimates. And I can tell you that the precision of these estimates uh, was uh, was higher than our expectations in the beginning, and 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 are enough, I would say, for 
for the sake of what these statistics are used for. I would say that this is just enough and, and you don't need to have it any more uh, precise. But of course, you know, with a, with a passage of time, we, we are learning new new methods, uh, we get more data and these that the standard errors the precision is, is growing. So uh, uh, we have basically implemented this in a crop estimate estimation, but uh, we have a plans and we have now applied for uh, another project that will try to take advantage of the same sources of the same infrastructure hardware that we have acquired and the software uh, for the purpose of you know a monitoring of urban areas of forestry environment and land cover. We've got, we, we got the same, like kind of like the same project application that we did with the crop estimates and we want to extend these uh, capacity into other areas of our interest. Uh, I, I, I'm very enthusiastic about it. So, for example, we also have some experimental work in a very kind of like peculiar topic of identifying the photovoltaics on the roofs, on the buildings, which is not that easy. You know, that there, there's no register for that. And it's very useful to know how many of those, you know, are already installed. And we've done, we've done that as well, you know, as an experimental work. That's really, uh, when you start something that, that starts very slowly, but when you get into it and then you realize that very easily you can expand it into the new areas. And, you know, the knowledge, the capacity, the people that you have, the staff, the capital, the human capital is just really uh, allows you to do so much more so much more quickly and of course there are advantages of remote sensing and i want to spend time on it it's pretty obvious that you know the speed the cost the, the accuracy the detail level you know all of that is in favor of these new methods i can tell you one additional example this is about you know agricultural statistics agriculture is also on the sea you know we, we just like uh, we've been experimenting with i i guess we we are already producing statistics based on an ais system you know a monitor system of the movement of the ships and we have applied that also and we did kind of like a part of a project for the Eurostat as well when we have specialized ourselves in monitoring the fishing fleet and, and, and producing statistics based on monitoring the fishing fleet uh, uh, which is part of an interesting story in terms of uh, what the Minister of Agriculture is interested in and of course uh, you can go to the github you know we even publish all of that because it's open open source open open algorithms so so uh, there, there, there's a lot of work that can be done you know even surprisingly sometimes you know the team that hasn't been designed for doing something in summary i can do uh, and can actually do like this team that was responsible for transportation you know statistics but they came up with the fishing fleet statistics workflow and, and we are already producing these as an experimental statistics but these are very important uh, 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 experiments i would say so uh, at the end i would just like to say uh, you know if you, if you if you want to do it that there's one advantage of official statistics i can tell you that whatever we do is not fragmented so because that, there are many problems projects everywhere, you know, different institutes, uh, different, you know, uh, universities doing something. But uh, then if you want to have a sustainable system of, you know, uh, producing numbers, which are required to take decisions, political decisions, and the official statistics has this huge advantage and it's very important to kind of like try to build this capacity within your premises. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dominique. It, it's, it's, it's really inspiring to hear what you have been able to do uh, at Statistical, uh, Statistic Poland. At the same time, thank you for reminding us we still really need to help many countries to build that basic infrastructure and capacity in order to pursue such uh, in innovations. So thank you so much. Now let's move to Kis. Kis uh, um, Ayumuza is the senior statistician uh, at uh, UBOS, Uganda. Kis, um, we would love to hear from you uh, on your perspective on the importance of delivering back to our survey respondents, including enhancing equity, access, and use of data for sustainable production. So here you go. Yes, I think we had the full screen. Maybe. Yes. Yeah, I fantastic. Myself. Yes. Yes. Uh, we are leaving no farmer behind, and uh, we need to enhance equity access and use of data for sustainable production. And uh, we need to first understand what are the benefits of data to farmers. And basically, data in this case uh, answers the five W's to a farmer what to produce, what type of commodities should a farmer engage in. Uh, that, of course, looking at food, 
and uh, income generation. Then when should the farmer produce? And here we look at the challenges of climate change where prediction and uh, forecasting of, of weather is critical to enable farmers to do timely planting. Otherwise, uh, it will be losses. Then which way to produce? A lot of technologies have been uh, developed that can support farmers, especially in the changing uh, times uh, in agriculture. When you have climate change, it means you have to create adaptation for farmers and this comes through uh, technologies like drought tolerant crops uh, which farmers can adopt but also the practices like irrigation since uh, rain fed agriculture these days is the challenge for most of the farmers then where to produce and here we are focusing on the agroecological aspects not all crops perform well in all kinds of soils or in all kinds of uh, climatic conditions so farmers need to understand what crops perform best where they are located then also consumers farmers need to understand their consumers uh, there is a lot of change that has taken place as uh, development happen, takes place the uh, incomes of, of of consumers change and they have put all choices of what to consume changes so farmers need to be uh, well aware of this then how do we enhance farmer participation in data production? Uh, it's very important that whenever we collect data from farmers, we need to give them feedback. Uh, since they are participants and key implementers of, uh, of the findings that may be derived from these surveys, it's good that we give them feedback to understand what exactly uh, came out of the surveys. Then accuracy and reliability of data. Yes, depending on uh, the circumstances or the outcomes of this data, farmers really want to relate with it. Does it actually tell the story? And at the end, uh, does it really impact their choices and decisions? Do they, does it enable them to make the right decisions to be able to answer their challenges? The nature and quality of data outcomes. Of course, as, as farmers provide us data, mostly from our experiences, they're always asking, what are you going to use this data for? They need to see the transformation that is coming from sharing of their data. So the policies that are developed, what is the timeliness of interventions after, find, after the findings? Uh, these are some of the things that uh, encourage farmers to always provide data when they see uh, answers to the challenges they face. Then also sensitization prior to data collection activities. As Uganda Bureau of Statistics, one of our best practices is before any uh, survey is undertaken, uh, farmers are always sensitized and made aware of the activity so that they embrace it and understand the objectives of the activity. Then also, it's also important to do translation of findings. Mostly you realize that farmers are locked out of benefits fit of um, what comes out of our studies or surveys, reason being most of these survey findings are disseminated in the most predominant language, which are the official languages. And yet, in a number of countries, we have multiple tribes with multiple languages and with farmers that are not uh, official language literate, but they are literate in their local languages. Then also, to some extent, incentives could um, enhance farmer participation. Then we ask ourselves, is there equity in access of information between the co rich corporate farmers and the subsistence farmers? Definitely not. Why? Uh, the rich farmers have capacity to invest in the necessary infrastructure. For example, you'll find them with a fully fledged uh, office or unit within uh, their farms that handles data production on farm and as well as data access. So this always enables them to make the right decisions. But unlike, this is unlike the subsistence farmer who doesn't have such uh, resources. And uh, also we have a challenge of limited internet connectivity and coverage. So you realize not the farmers in the rural areas are able to benefit from maybe what may be broadcast on television, especially disseminations or information that may be relayed through radio, or even what they may need to access through the internet. 
Then also limited uh, information, communication technology literacy. Yes, many of our farmers are illiterate and access one to gadgets, but also navigating the internet to be able to find the data and information that they need is a challenge. Then high cost of gadgets and internet data. It's not, it's not easy for a smallholder farmer or a subsistence farmer, especially compared to their incomes, to acquire smartphones. But also we have seen a cost on uh, internet data that is high, especially with taxes, taxes that have been uh, added to the data. So it makes it difficult for a farmer to regularly load data and be able to search for information that they need. Then also language barriers. Then also small scale farmers mostly depend on traditional knowledge while the corporate use scientific knowledge from research. And of course we have seen recent in most recent uh, in the most recent times that traditional knowledge has been disappointing when farmers have learned how to predict their rainy seasons and uh, when they plant things fail to, to perform. Then uh, of course not all data is free. Maybe data that may come through the NSOs may be free, but there is data that is uh, produced by private, the private sector or academia. It may not be free for access to all farmers. And yet this can be accessed actually by the rich farmers because they can afford it. Then uh, how, do we also, how do we enhance farm access to user data? We are saying let's invest in farmer feedback and interface mechanisms. After collecting data, analyzing it, uh, let's go back to the farmer and share these findings with them. Then also create agricultural data open access platforms where farmers can actually find this data and let these platforms be user friendly. Uh, then we're also looking at innovation in dissemination, data visualization, after understanding that most of our farmers are not statistical literate. So we need to present findings or outputs in the simplest way possible through figures, through graphs and uh, diagrams. Then also let's take advantage of the opportunity of uh, pharma groups. These pharma groups enable us to share information easily, but also it enables interpretation of this data easily because through a group, people are able to make interpretation of this data, unlike when someone is an individual. Then technology and innovation. Let's look at having agricultural apps that are enable data sharing and also increase the awareness and sensitization about the relevance of data to farmers would enable them to uh, desire more of it. Then how do we maximize data innovations for farmers? And here we're focusing on the roles of the public sector, academia, private sector, and uh, the public uh, and other organizations. Here, first of all, whenever we have any new innovations, uh, it means it comes with a need to build capacity to be able to uh, operate with these innovations and appreciate them better. Then also awareness creation. The more awareness created about an innovation, it increases its adoption within the, the, the data production and consumption uh, system. Then also increased funding. Yes, whenever a new innovation comes, it means systems have to also transform. So you find that you need to acquire uh, certain uh, infrastructure that can support the innovation. So funding is key. Then also we need to enhance collaboration between institutions. You'll find that one institution has data and another institution needs that data, but they're not aware of it. So it makes it uh, a wasted effort, or since resources are scarce in data production, you don't have to duplicate efforts. So you get to know what another partner has. Then integration of the innovations into the academia, the earlier students get to interact with these innovations, the better to be able to work with them when they are in the, in, in, in the field of work. Then also integrate these innovations in data production as well as enhance data utilization through address of access and equity. And what are the recommendations? We need to establish and strengthen lower level community, community information systems. These are systems not only to benefit the data producers by enabling them get more data from the lower level, but also we need to relay information back to the lowest level where most of these marginalized farmers exist. Then also translated versions of statistics findings. Like I said, uh, many of our farmers are illiterate. However, most of our findings are disseminated in the official languages. So it is key that we translate these findings into a language that most of the farmers can also uh, relate with and utilize. Then also we need 
to enhance number and capacity of information sharing uh, access points. There are a number of structures in place where information can be relayed back to the farmer through extension workers, farmer groups, agro-input dealers, and the apps. Then innovation for more affordable and user-friendly technologies. Then we need to do more investment in generating small area estimates. These enable farmers at their lower level to be able to make decisions. Unlike estimates that are district or uh, regional level, where a farmer may not easily, easily uh, relate with or utilize. Then also statistical literacy should be widely promoted up to the lower level. <coughs> and uh, lower costs of internet data should surely be able to enhance farmer access to data and information. Then also enhancing the ICT infrastructure development. Uh, that is ensuring that connectivity and uh, network coverage uh, covers a wider scope of uh, any given uh, area. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing uh, Uganda's experience. Uh, no wonder that you are a front runner in the continent in adopting uh, innovation. You know, really, uh, your vision and practical approaches are just very inspiring. Yes, I realize that uh, I have not been good at uh, timekeeping, so we have only a few minutes left. I'm, I'm very glad that there are already questions and answers uh, uh, in, in the chat. So here, maybe I'll just quickly invite our panelists uh, to, to say a few words. Um, uh, first, first uh, Talib, um, you know, Thank you very much for sharing uh, what you have been uh, leading and in, in supporting countries adopt. But in your view, uh, looking forward, uh, where beyond uh, uh, crop types, mapping and yield estimation, you see uh, the future uh, new applications would yield a, a great potential? Hi, hi, Sean. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. Actually, uh, we have a relatively modest uh, work program uh, ahead of us in 50 by 30 because it, it sort of has this uh, focus on cereal crops uh, and, and area mapping and yield estimation. So there's quite a bit of, uh, I guess, uh, ground to, to cover if we aspire to it. Uh, obviously, non-cereal crops, uh, which also have uh, food security implications in, in all of the countries that we're working in. Uh, is another area that uh, could be moved into, uh, as well as uh, as well as this uh, area of uh, kind of early early season uh, predictions uh, of the outcomes that that we're interested in, uh, and probably probably making more progress in uh, in intertemporal predictions uh, as well. Uh, just to just to also understand whether uh, training data collected in in early years could be useful for. Uh, later, later predictions. So I think that's on research, but I think on data use specifically, as it relates to some of the comments that uh, Keith has made, uh, we we sort of have to put this research into practice uh, in in the context of upcoming household surveys. But but ultimately, uh, in, at the fingertips of uh, of the clients that we're working in uh, as as part of the 50 by 30 initiative, but probably more broadly at the World Bank. So I think that that last mile will will take quite a bit of effort uh, on our part. Thank you so much. Uh, I know uh, our time is very short, but uh, uh, Keith, Keith, Keith um, uh, please. Matt, actually, I'd go to Ahmed. Ahmed, maybe you can comment on how in what you're doing to ensure privacy uh, um, since uh, so much data are being made open, and how do you deal with the perceived risk of uh, disclosure and privacy? Very, uh, yeah, very good. Very good question. So there are two things. One is, for example, in the design of the new data collection form, there is a question that the farmer should be given the information and have the consent for the data to be collected and shared. So that is at the start of the data collection to make sure there is that communication and the farmer agrees to that, whether a benefit is coming back to the farmer, like Keith was talking about it, or the farmer is, is happy to do that. So there is starting from that, and any data that comes to MOHAP should have that consent from the farmer. And secondly, we have implemented solutions, and we have data sets that are like that, that are anonymized in terms of location. So the data is there, the field boundary, not blurred or in some sense noisy, but they are matched with the imagery and shared in a way that the ML model can consume them, but no one can trace back where on earth exactly is this pixel, for example. So in that way, we can build machine learning models, we can build analytics, but we can't trace it back to an individual, a farmer or a household. 
so both of these are, are now uh, rolling out and yeah, we are happy to test them out in other locations or with other like privacy concerns or regulations in, in regional aspects. Great, yeah, thank you so much. Jess, do you want to comment on the same issue from your experience? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Just, just how do you deal with uh, uh, the perceived risk of disclosure and privacy issue when it comes to using georeference data? It's a very complicated question. <laughs> uh, so we, um, we have a data privacy policy, um, and it's because a lot of our, our customers are actually based in, the, in, in Europe where they have uh, GDPR about how data is shared. Um, and so our policy is that the customers own their data. Um, and so we actually do not sell any data from farmers to third parties. Um, and it depends on who purchases the devices um, for projects like when a large NGO buys a number of devices to put out and they end up in farmers' fields. Um, it becomes a little bit murky on how that data set is used. Um, and that's an issue that we are still working through on what is considered, you know, uh, a PII within that data set and what, what can be shared and what can't be shared. Um, and it's a, a sensitive topic that we're working through right now. And I, I, I think it's something that we'll know more as, as, as we continue to, to do large scale projects on what is the right way to treat the data. Yeah, thank you. Sorry that, for that's, that. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. No, it's really great. Yeah, now to just quickly go to Dominic and Keith. So Dominic, you, you've been able to lead such a transformative changes in Statistics Poland. Um, as, as a very established uh, NSO, was there any resistance to, to such changes and how did you manage it? Just very briefly. Just, it's just very, yeah, of course, I understand that. It was a stronger resistance at the beginning, even, even if everybody claims now that there was no, because now we see the results. But uh, I can tell you uh, that was a part of a wider initiative that I told people, you know, I'm going to talk only about the innovations and we are going to spur innovation culture here. And you are going to report to me annually about the innovations that you have introduced in your departments, not only in terms of new methods, but whatever innovation, product, product, you know, product process, you know, communication innovations. So I've been discussing only those and I, I, there was a strong message from the from 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 from, from the top that uh, I'm expecting innovations and we have to put to that and, and 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 particularly to the statistics department I told them that I'm sending them to the space and it's up to them to decide whether this will, this is going to be a rhetorical figure or I will send them you know physically but uh, but uh, really you know just when we discuss these issues it turned out that it is all feasible and uh, with a little bit of the effort we can gain so much and be ahead of of the time now. Yeah, thank you. That, that's really incredible. And now, Keith, you have the last words. Um, I, I won't give you a specific question, but if anything you want to say to conclude this session. Uh, yes, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, one, I, I talk as a farmer, and of course, uh, it's uh, out of experience as a farmer in relationship to data as well as working with Uganda Bureau of Statistics. Uh, from my experience, when I interact with farmers, uh, you realize there is a communication gap. It's true, a lot of data is collected, but it looks like at the end, it's for the consumption of the, uh, of the policy makers, decision makers. However, we forget something that it's the farmer that will be the key implementer of any of the decisions and choices that are made. Otherwise, sometimes we wonder why adoption of certain technologies is low. We only go to collect data to understand how farmers have adopted them, and yet we probably never share these technologies. So it's, to me, a plea and a request, especially when we are dealing with um, agriculture, maybe let me use the developing countries, because statistics have it that majority of the population in uh, developing countries uh, depend on subsistence farming. So any, any, any intervention in terms of uh, development and uh, impacting of households through transformation of agriculture must look at this sector as key. If any transformation must occur, then the subsistence sector must be looked at as a key sector. Otherwise, they are the majority of our population. Right. So if we make any decisions, choices without their contribution or participation, or even understanding what's happening, like climate change is a reality. 
But when I go to my community, people are still using traditional uh, mm. prediction of weather forecasting methods. And it, it, it's hurting when you find a farmer planting after three, four weeks of rain failure, they have to replant, and right. these are losses. Right. So I think, I think uh, dissemination to the lowest level should be given priority. So when budgeting is being made, it shouldn't only allocate a lot of funding to data collection and data processing activities, but we also need to give effort back how this message runs back right. to the farmer. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kis, for, for helping us to conclude this session and draw our attention back to why we started to do all these innovations so that we can really change the life and livelihood of, of those people on the ground. So on that note, let's conclude this, uh, this session. Thank you, our uh, uh, audience, for staying with us. This is a really uh, amazing session with such uh, inspiring speakers. Um, this is just a start of how we should come together much more closely to innovate and bring the benefit back to the ground. So with that, um, let's conclude the session. Thank you all and look forward to seeing you all um, throughout the year uh, through the under, under the 50 by 30 initiative and more broadly through our collaboration towards the next World Data Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.